Good evening, everybody. It's hot. <laughs> Welcome to the Bennington Select Board meeting. It is uh, March 23rd, 2015, 6 p.m. We are at the River Street Firehouse. Please join me in a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did somebody get it wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is the minutes from March 9th. Do I have a motion to accept? I move they be accepted as printed. Second. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? John, you were not here, right? That's right. Okay, so yep. we have five and one abstain and one absent. Um, okay, uh, I wanted, we'll go ahead and introduce the select board. I forgot that part for the first time. Uh, to my far left, Tom Jacobs. Hello. Uh, and Michael Keane. Hi. Our, our uh, vice chair, Sharon Brush. Hi. I'm your chair, Greg Van Houten. It's James Carroll. John McFadden. Uh, Justin Corcoran is absent tonight. He's ill. And Stuart Hurd, our town manager. Linda Bermuda is recording. We meet the second and fourth Monday of every month at the River Street Firehouse at 6 p.m. unless otherwise warned. So please feel free to join us or tune in on CAT TV. Uh, this is my last meeting as chair and on the select board. Uh, my term is up at the end of this month. So I want to thank everyone for their support and for their involvement. And welcome Donald Campbell, who will be joining the select board, has been sworn in and uh, will be on the board uh, as of April 1st. And um, Jim Carroll, who was re-elected to his seat. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the board and to the staff for all your help and, and support. Uh, next is warrants. Do we have any questions for the town manager on warrants? No. John, anything? I'm all set. Jim? No, I'm I, had, I just have oh. one. It, it's, it's more informational, uh, and I'm trying to remember. It was a payment on the uh, Ninja Trail uh, work still. What's That was for $9,000. Uh, that was for our consultant. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a part of the consultant cost. For, uh, we're looking at a river crossing. I think we received a grant for it. Uh, we're looking at a river crossing and also a road crossing as part of that trail pattern, and uh, that cost is, is obviously grant paid. Right. I take it back. I do have a question. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Uh, fourth from the bottom on the uh, front page, too, it's Benner, Bennington Banner, website bundle, and uh, That is part of our, our marketing uh, cost, I believe. Uh, Mike Harrington's budget. And, uh, Mike, why don't you just tell us? Sure. That, uh, if you've been online uh, or have seen in the paper, that's part of the Project Catalyst, the community outreach program. So we shared that cost with the banner, and they actually gave us a, a great rate uh, and, and reduced it in half of what it typically would be for that type of promotion. Um, but again, it promotes the uh, anonymous tip line and then the different outreach that's going on. So those are the ads we've been seeing in the paper. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we're trying something a little different tonight. We've moved citizens portion to the end of the program to uh, um, accommodate what's really been a trend is uh, citizens coming to uh, comment or listen to something on the agenda. Uh, so this actually gives them a chance to listen to what's going on and then comment or ask questions further at that. Also, um, when we have guests here that are scheduled to make a presentation, we can more accurately tell them what time they'll be uh, doing that. So that's an experiment we're trying tonight. So we're going to move um, right into the Applegate Block Grant deferral request. Uh, Michael Harrington, our Community Economic Development Director, will lead this. Good evening. Uh, this is the second time uh, we're before the board. Uh, Nancy Owens is here. Uh, for representing Housing Vermont regarding Applegate's Community Development Block Grant. Uh, there are two components to this. The first is uh, what they've requested as a 30-year deferral, uh, which again, as described at the last meeting, uh, allows the town to remain an equity partner in the project uh, while they continue to do uh, needed upgrades and rehab uh, to the development. Specifically, this time, it is around uh, energy efficiency upgrades. Um, the second component to this is that 
they will be looking to implement a new ownership structure still uh, involving Housing Vermont, but those are the two components that they've asked for uh, as we look to renew uh, the deferral on this project. Thank you. And I'll answer any questions, and so will Nancy if you have questions for them specifically. Board, uh, I sent an email. I didn't get anything back. Does anybody have any further questions for? I had a quick question okay. that I think could be answered better at, at the meeting. Um, the only question I really had was about sustainability. And time and time again, I think this has come up a, a few different times while I've been on the board at least. Um, you've mentioned that it's very typical mm -hmm. for these loans to be deferred and never actually paid off. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a sustainability standpoint, why why can't we find a project that might be able to sustain itself and eventually pay that back? It's usually typical for uh, low, uh, low income or um, affordable housing projects specifically. We have had uh, community development block grants that are related to business growth and those do get paid back. Uh, but part of the project and the expectation that these are deferred, again, allows the community to remain an equity partner in the project. So if the project is not performing at any point during the deferral, we can always uh, fall back on the fact that we have a loan against the project uh, and make that come due at any point should we feel that the project is not performing. The second piece of that, and Nancy may be able to speak better to this, but uh, it also continually allows the rents to stay affordable at whatever project you're talking about. So uh, part of the understanding with these projects is that the continuation of keeping rents at a lower amount uh, and affordable also requires um, some forgiveness on the loan piece. So those are the two components that fall into a project like this, um, and f specifically uh, as they relate to community development block grants across the state and across the country. So understanding that um, a large capital investment would be necessary for this type of project, whether it be new or refurbishment, um, would there be a plan or could there be a plan uh, put in place where, because the loan, or the, the low interest uh, rent should go up over time as well mm -hmm. because people are making more money and that, that group, even though it's low to affordable income, whatever you want to call it, um, that group is going to also increase 2% a year or whatever we happen to see year after year. So um, if they don't have that capital investment, are they not putting money away for these types of repairs that are required and not putting money away? I mean, how does, how does that work and how come it can't um, be built into the project over the next 30 years so that they're prepared for payments? Sure. I, and I'll let Nancy speak to the specifics of of Applegate and maybe other projects that Housing Vermont has been involved in. Um, I. That certainly is an option uh, for the town if it wanted to lend the money and recapture that funding over time. Um, but again, this is based on best practices in which um, you saw in your packet last time uh, from uh, the Agency of, of Commerce and Community Development regarding how these projects are usually uh, funded and then uh, deferred over time. Uh, again, I think part of it is again remaining an equity partner in the project, um, but I'll let Nancy speak to, to that specifically. Hi. Um, my name is Nancy Owens. I'm from Housing Vermont, and we're the, one of the owners of Applegate. Um, so I heard your question as being about really um, the sustainability of Applegate in particular and around like question it's, about it, replacement It actually isn't reserves. about the, this project in particular because mm. I think this is a good project that, okay. that should move forward. It's just um, more general. I, when, whenever I hear about these projects, it's always mm. well, yes, they're loans, but we're never going to pay them back. And mm. and and the understanding that this is just how it works. This is how it always happens, or usually happens. That kind of um, mm -hmm. strikes a nerve with me. Just to say, this is how it always happens. <laughs> so let's just let money float out there time and time again. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, I think this project's good and I, I, I want to see it move forward. I just, I can't get my mind wrapped around um, the, the planning aspect of it and why we can't try and put a project in place yeah. that, is, that is meant to, well, not, not go uh, with the norm, so to speak, and, and plans to pay the monies back. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's well known that in 30 years the money's going to come due if we do defer it. Yeah. So I'll speak to that more gen generally then, because um, just to give you a little background, because you, I don't think you were here last time when I was here, right. but Housing Vermont is a nonprofit real estate development company, and we have been in business, um, this is our 26th year. We have about close to 5,000 apartments all around Vermont and 145 properties. 
Um, and we work in partnership with other nonprofit organizations and towns and small groups around the state to build, own, and, uh, and sustain affordable rental housing. So what you see is the model is that the rents that folks who live in affordable housing are really meant to cover the operational expenses. They don't, there's no, um, the, there's no capacity for the rent to cover really any debt. And that's how affordable housing currently is financed in the United States. 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. The federal government, housing, urban and development um, financed affordable housing through the use of project-based Section 8 contracts. And sec if, if, if you've probably heard of Section 8 housing, right? So a private developer or a nonprofit or whoever would build Section 8 housing They'd borrow the money from the federal government and they'd pay it back over time. But the way they paid it back was the federal government gave them enough resource, uh, or they let them charge a high enough rent to carry that debt service. So the tenant might pay three or four hundred dollars for rent, and then the 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 owner would receive um, the equivalent of say eight hundred dollars for rent from the federal government for their Section 8 unit. And that difference between what the tenant pays, what it costs to operate, and the debt service, the owner would then turn back and pay back the federal government. Not, that's the way housing was financed for a long time. 25 years ago, they created the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and the basic premise of the tax credit program, especially in rural communities where rents are low, is that you finance all the capital up front and you keep rents low by not having debt service. And, and you just try to get, a, you know, get a, an operating expense and rent system that works where operations expenses are gonna increase over time. Hopefully, as you said, people's incomes hopefully will also increase a little bit over time and we can increase the rents. Um, what we see is, you know, is it's a little bit wavy, right, and some, sometimes people's incomes are not going up, the economy's not so good, cost of living increases aren't made, or jo you know, jobs aren't paying more. So we see some stagnation. And sometimes we see operating expenses increasing faster, whether that's property taxes or fuel bills in the case of Applegate. And in 2008, everybody saw huge increases in fuel expenses. So, so we work a fine line to, kind of, to keep um, that difference between expenses and rents. And, um, we also do set aside money for replacement reserves. The, the standard is to set aside $50 a unit a month for replacement reserves for things like, you know, restriping the pavement and replacing uh, fixtures or when there's a turnover, replacing appliances and cabinets and that sort of thing. But what it's really not possible to save for, especially at a large property like, like Applegate, is the replacement of all of the roofs. Or, um, you know, what we're doing with this refinance is it's, it's really a refinance and recapitalization to invest at Applegate. And that's just not something that we could save for. It's just like in your own home, if you, if you, it's time to. Um, do a major repair, and in this case we have 104 apartments to repair. Um, you go to the bank and you borrow a little more money. In our instance, we can't borrow money, we go and we raise capital through these investors and through some um, grants and other programs. But, so in the big picture, you know, it is a balance of those rents and the expenses. We do save for capital expenses on a but when it's time to recapitalize and refinance, that's when we need to come in. And if you've got a chance to read the packet, but um, one of the really great things that's happening at Applegate and is a really terrific opportunity is the investment in energy efficiency. And we have seen, you know, just so much improvement and understanding um, about how important it is to really have weather type buildings to look at um, new fuel sources like we are at Applegate with a pellet system. And um, we've been doing that for the last four or five years across our portfolio and seeing just tremendous um, savings, helping us to cap 
that, those rising expenses, helping us to control some of those rising expenses so that we can keep rents affordable. So it's, um, it's not a conventional system from a free market standpoint about like how you think real estate works. Affordable housing real estate is a little quirky. Right, now that's, that's a good explanation is <laughs> what I was looking for. Okay. Um, is there, Michael, maybe this is a question for you, but is there a reason that we don't just call it a grant instead of a loan? <laughs> <laughs> um, beyond my pay grade. Uh, okay. I mean, and essentially it goes through, and Nancy, feel free to jump in, but um, it, the program through the state, which comes through the federal government, is the Community Development Block Grant Loan Program. Um, and, and if you want to talk about the structuring of it as a loan as opposed to a grant, I mean, you've answered my questions, you know, so I'm, I'm more than satisfied. I just, I want to be able to look at a piece of paper and say, oh, it's, a, it's called a loan, but I know that right. we're not going to get this, <laughs> you know, and, and not just for this project, but moving forward in general, because it needs to go into all of our calculations when looking at our budget and, and everything. So um, if it's never going to come back, I don't, I don't know if maybe you knew this already ahead of time, but if it's money that's not coming back, then it's something that we should plan for, regardless of if it's, if it's called a loan or a grant or whatever sure. and, and and just so um, the board is clear too when the the actual community block grant was awarded there were no uh, local funds uh, contributed to the the CDBG similar as we're doing with with Shires housing now um, so again uh, just so you're aware of that those are monies that are funneled down through us from the state okay thank you Okay. I, and I, my understanding is, has been that the, the reason behind calling it a loan is to keep us involved in the conversation so that we have to have this conversation once I, in a I think, while. And you bring up a good point, Greg, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier, but in our conversations uh, with Housing Vermont and Applegate, I mean, one of the important parts of this project is that as a loan, it does allow us, uh, again, to have uh, equity in the project and, and be able to use that as leverage so that you know, in this case, um, it's under good supervision and, and operating accordingly, but that wasn't always the case with Applegate and it hasn't always been the case with other affordable housing projects. So this allows us to have leverage over them should it cease to perform to the expectation that we have as a community. Okay, thanks, Michael. Tom? Um, I know uh, two weeks ago we talked about the amortization uh, in the 98, I, remember I recall that the loan was deferred for 15 years uh, and I is if the loan is again deferred for 15 years does that change your operation or the rental structure how's that impact if it it is a fifth if we vote on a 15 year rather than a 30 year yeah I would um, uh, I proposed a 30 year because that's sort of become the standard in the industry and what the state sees and expects um, I in the discussion we had a couple of weeks ago, I went back and looked at it, and I think what, if you all would prefer us to come back sooner and not wait 30 years to have this conversation again, <laughs> um, I think that would work for the project is a 20-year term. And okay. So That's, we would that, be, that would be acceptable to us if that would be preferable for you. I just see that if there's going to be any equity, which is right. a real significant question at this point, uh, the future board or whoever is looking at this, looking at it sooner rather than 30 years out mm -hmm. when the, the property may be fully depreciated. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that's responsive. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anyone else have a question for Nancy? No, but I would support uh, Tom's point there with 20 years. And uh, one question that I brought up with you yeah. last, <clears throat> last week was, first of all, this is a $7 million injection to our local economy. And uh, I ask for greater assurances from you that we would have as many local contractors as possible. Mm -hmm. And not just one ad in the banner, you know, leading up to uh, uh, the, uh, the start of this project, but continuous and regular uh, advertising in uh, local newspapers that would attract uh, local contractors. And I, I need your assurance uh, tonight for that. So, um, and we, we work with a general contractor and we'll, we will, um, in our process of procuring the general contractor, we, we will advertise and we, will, we can advertise over a number of days or weeks. Um, and what kind of, I'm sorry to interrupt, what kind of oversight 
uh, do you have with respect to uh, uh, the, the general contractor and uh, suggesting uh, local contractors? That may be better understood too. Uh, I was just asking Nancy about her procurement process and the mm -hmm. fact that it is a federal pr procurement process. So the ability to select based on where a business is located is not allowed under the federal procurement process. Um, so they can certainly um, uh, tweak or impact the, the amount of advertising they do locally and the promotion of the project and the fact that um, you know, interested contractors should send in uh, RFPs, uh, requests for proposals, but in terms of the selection, you have to make it based on their, their qualifying uh, uh, criteria that is predetermined by the procurement process. Well, my question for you then is, isn't Shires, uh, aren't their projects almost identical in, in status? Not the one that you just recently spoke about. So again, um, that was not using uh, federal funds for the project and was not that a was state funds. process. Right. So their their local project was not, but things like um, potentially, well, in this case, uh, the Monument View project uh, mm -hmm. or the Roaring Branch project, those would be, and mm -hmm. they would have to follow the federal procurement guidelines. Okay. What are the guidelines on final submission of proposals? So let's say that um, a local contractor doesn't necessarily win the bid during the first round. Would you be able to go to a local contractor and say, here's the price that you need to meet or beat? It has to be the closed envelope yeah. scenario. But, okay. And it, just to note, um, if, if you are a contractor and you're not used to this, there are agencies such as PTAC or the Small Business Administration that can help you prepare your, your bidding process for these types of things. Uh, there's a lot of help at the state level. Um, certainly see Michael Harrington about that if, you, if you're not familiar with that. Um, but if you want to become part of that bidding process, there are prerequisites and you can find out what you need to have in place to put those bids together. Yeah, we can also um, work with Michael or this town about um, doing the reverse, you know, getting names of sub potential subcontractors or suppliers and providing them to the general contractors who may be bidding. So that would be another way is we can go, we can go both directions, both advertising more publicly and then sending information directly to the general Okay. So you're able, and just to clarify, so you can reach out to specific contractors and encourage them to submit proposals. Yes. Okay, great. So you can, but um, what I need to know is, will you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah, you just can't give them numbers. Okay. Yes. So. Okay. I'll make the motion that we uh, grant the block grant deferral request for 20 years. I'll second. Yeah. Okay. We have a, any discussion? Okay. And those in favor? That is unanimous, one absent. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Uh, just for clarification, I was just asking Nancy, um, can we, we're also looking for approval to transfer the ownership uh, or the, the loan uh, at the time of the new ownership. Uh, and do you have a timeline on that? So as part of the redevelopment, we have to establish a new ownership entity. We're hopeful that we can start, um, do that work this summer and start work this summer. But it would contingent on securing all of the financing. So the earliest it would happen would be, say, July of this summer. If the latest would be next spring. OK. So and, and the question is whether or not the board is OK with us transferring uh, the ownership of the loan. Uh, and. From from to just give me a, a from what to what. So in, in the loan we identify who the ownership structure is because right. they're gonna be reorganizing as part of this process. We would simply need to identify the new ownership the structure. The names are gonna change, right. basically. Yeah. It's essentially your collateral is the property, right? And so you're loaning to Applegate um, Housing Limited Partnership will establish a new partnership. Applegate two, I don't know if it'll be so, but and um, and the the property will be transferred to that new prop new owner, and at the time all of the debt will be assumed by the new owner. So essentially, the what I want to just be clear about is that the deferral in the loan terms you you accept or you will allow for the assumption of the, the loan by the new owner at the time um, of construction start. Do you want to just amend your motion? Not, why don't we, that's ahead. a good separate, I think it's yeah. a separate uh, motion and I would uh, uh, 
make the motion that the uh, successor uh, owner uh, be, uh, if not recognized now, be allowed to assume the uh, terms of the grant. Okay. I'll second that. That's well stated. Any discussion on that? Um, does that sound? What, what was the reason behind the name changing? Is that just for applications of and uh, the ability to reach out and grab other grants or loans available? Or it is, it is directly related to the refinancing that we, we need a new a new entity to own the property. It's it's part just of the partnership banking, re banking regulations and the stipulations from the they wouldn't have been allowed to grab onto other loans and grants yes. under the same organization. That's correct. That we wouldn't have been able to, we are using this low income housing tax credit program, which is a federal program, and uh, a substantial portion of the credits that are created, um, the, the property needs to transfer hands in order to make that happen. And so there's a transfer of ownership to a new entity. Is that is that also common it's to, very to common, just like change? I said. <laughs> just to change. Just the way it's done. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. It it is. Point out that Housing Vermont will continue to be, to be one of the part. One of the, the members of whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's again it's it's part of how it's you know I'd be I'd be happy to spend more time talking with you. About no, no, no. It's just so from my perspective, it's yeah. a good project that I want to see go forward. It just. Yeah has the appearance of a very shady <laughs> political financing scheme yeah. that just makes me nervous. But John, it's called yeah. the wonderful world of banking. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so, no, I, I appreciate no. it. I and just I have to ask my questions. And I understand it, 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 how it sounds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we have a motion. Do I have a vote? Uh, the uh, the oh, only sorry, other I, thing that I wanted to mention I, was, um, I know it's one of the first times that we're pushing the citizens yeah. to the end, but what if they had wanted to speak about this? <clears throat> There are some folks okay. here from Applegate residents as well as the, the property manager. I'm, I'm not suggesting okay. that they might right. have any yeah. comments whatsoever, right. but okay. before we vote, or should we give them an, uh, I, I know we're in discussion right now with the motion right. on the, on the floor, the but, on the table, but I don't know how we wanted to handle that. <laughs> Sorry. I, mean, I haven't heard, I mean, we haven't heard anything from anyone during the week on it. Okay. You know, that, that or anyone who would anyone wish to be week. heard, or anyone last week. So that Doesn't was happen, kind of have to happen that. now, but I think moving right. forward, we might want to address that. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Okay. Um, anyone else? No. In discussion. Those in favor? All right. That is six and one absent. Thank, Thank you, you Nancy. Thank you very much. And that's why we're trying it. <laughs> Just to speak to that before we go yeah. to the next. You know, we have this a two meeting process. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be an appropriate time in the first meeting for comment and then for the board to deliberate at the second one right. and not have it reopened. So I would right. think that's one of the reasons we have a two meeting right. okay. so that the community can participate at, at the part of the first. Yeah, sounds good. You know. I, know, I know oftentimes the first meeting is what triggers the understanding that right. things are being talked about. And, and it can often bring in a crowd for the second meeting. And so I, I just don't want anyone to yeah. come and want to be heard and then not get the opportunity. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to work. We'll probably yeah. Yeah. figure it out as we move forward. But um, it should be taken into consideration no, before any votes are made. That's a good point. Thank you. All right, next item on agenda is uh, a follow-up to the uh, Article 15 on town meeting day regarding fluoridation of the water that was uh, voted down um, by an advisory vote. Uh, we have put this on an agenda as a follow-up. Uh, it says final discussion. It's certainly not the final discussion, if I have anything to say about it. Um, we, uh, last week, the uh, Bennington Oral Health Coalition asked to uh, be part of this conversation. We have also uh, extended invitations to folks who have been here uh, on the topic of oral health to come forward. And um, so at this point, uh, I have a letter from the Bennington Oral Health Coalition. Uh, and. They have, it's twofold. Uh, the Bennington Oral Health Coalition, as you know, as I've stated many times, came out of the, uh, the VCRD community meetings um, and has been a town endorsed uh, committee. Uh, they are asking to be a uh, sanctioned subcommittee of the Board of Health, which is us as well, in a, in a separate role from Select Board. And uh, they are inviting folks to come to a meeting on April 22nd, 2015 at 6 p.m. right here at the firehouse. And um, we can post this information. Uh, 
There's an RSVP number at 447-3700 or info at benningtonoralhealth.com. Um, at this meeting, we will ask the community members to present ideas and concrete actions that can begin to address the oral health problems in Bennington. We are in need of additional volunteers to work on ideas and action steps that will be generated at the meeting. Thank you in advance for, for participating to make a difference in this important public health issue. Um, so that's, the, that's part one. Part two or, or was the, uh, the request to be, the, I'm just going to take a portion of this letter. Um, the Bennington Oral Health Coalition requests the Select Board to formally appoint the coalition as an action committee of the Select Board under the umbrella of the Bennington Board of Health to work to address the oral health problems in Bennington. So it's a two-part thing. Um, I would, uh, it's something that I was suggesting and they, they kind of headed me off and, and asked to, to do this. Um, as you know, they've been working for several years on the issue of oral health. There are a lot of people who came forward with suggestions other than fluoridation and I think this is the time to start working as an action committee and uh, getting members of the public to put some of these ideas to use and evaluate them. Um, I like the idea of, of endorsing them as a subcommittee of the Board of Health um, and asking them to report to, this, to the Board of Health slash select board uh, on a quarterly basis, uh, let, letting us know how things are going or letting you folks know I'll be on the other side of the mic, um, but uh, how things are going and what they need because there certainly will be times when they're going to need funding sources or direction or endorsements, things like that. But. Uh, the conversation happened 12 years ago, and we basically have a generation of school children who have gone through our school system without the action uh, that they needed, and I don't want to see that happen again. So um, if anyone from the Oral Health Coalition or from the audience has anything they'd like to, to say, Charlie, go ahead uh, to add to that, or either one. That one's fine, right where you are. Please just identify yourself. Yeah, this is, I'm, my name is Charlie Jingo. I'm a member of the Oral Health Coalition. And one of the things that I also wanted to make sure that the select board and the community was clear about is that we are withdrawing our recommendation to fluoridate the Bennington water system. We also saw what the town vote was. And, but one of the important, and I, I want to make sure that that's very clear to the board members here that we're withdrawing that recommendation to fluoridate the water system. But the results of the town vote really don't do anything to address the deplorable health, oral health conditions that a lot of people in Bennington face. It, one of the positive things that I think has happened in the past several months since we've been talking about this issue of fluoridation is that people on all sides of the fluoridation issue really have acknowledged that we've got an oral health problem here that we can't just wish away or hope goes away. We've, we can't walk away from it. We've got to do something. So if we're not going to do fluoridation, what can we do as a community? And Greg mentioned a couple of the things that in, in the letter, one was to form, formally appoint the Oral Health Coalition as an action committee of the select board sitting as the Board of Health and that we would report back to you on any progress made over the course of the next year, the next couple years, whatever it might be, on some kind of quarterly basis or thereabouts. And the second thing was the April 22nd um, meeting where we're hoping that we get a large turnout of people from the community to really generate ideas to come up with some tangible steps and to volunteer to, to help so that we can at least start bending the curve on the problem that so many kids and adults in our community are dealing with. Last month at the uh, community forum on water fluoridation that the coalition put on, I read a long list of 
ideas and tasks that the coalition has been working on for the past several years. And I just wanted to remind folks just of a, just a small handful. One of the things that we really want to do is identify and organize some volunteers who can help during the free dental day that's going to take place on April 25th. It's the last Saturday in April. And that's the day where local dentists and their staff volunteer their time to literally pull people's teeth who need their teeth removed. So we're looking for volunteers who might help, for example, staff a registration desk, who might transport people who need teeth pulled to and from their appointments, and maybe help with the teardown at the end of the day. There may be other tasks also. That's one of the ideas that I presented last month that I just want to reiterate this evening. Another thing that we're looking for are volunteers who will help drive people to the dental hygiene clinics over at Hudson Valley Community College, another thing. It's my understanding that the select board is still holding joint meetings on a monthly or so basis with the Bennington School District Board. And we would ask the select board and or both the select board and the BSD board to put oral health on the agenda to see if there are some ideas that you have that the BSD board has to start addressing some of the issues, particularly for kids in the schools. And the last couple ideas, uh, one of the educational campaigns that we're doing is called Rethink Your Drink uh, to see if there are ways to really educate the community about getting away from the really sugar-laden beverages and looking at more healthful ways to hydrate. And lastly, one of the, again, by no means a comprehensive list, these are just some of the things mentioned last month, just to remind folks. We're looking at doing a, a poster campaign in local elementary schools on good dental health. Um, maybe have small monetary awards for the winners, and then to really publicize and get that information out there. A lot of these small steps can make a difference, but we really, as a community, need to come together, not just a coalition, but the community to say, okay, we have a problem, what can we do? And let's do something. Let's not wait 12 more years before something gets done. Let's start today. So thank you for... Charlie, just to clarify, sure. uh, as far as membership in the committee, I just want to clarify to people that this is not something that um, is an exclusive committee of, of medical people or a particular profession that, Correct. that the community is invited to be part of the oral health coalition. And one of, the, one of the things that we may find is that people want to volunteer for a task. Yeah. So somebody may be interested in helping with the free dental day and maybe they're interested in helping every year right. at the free dental day and that's the task. And maybe somebody's interested in helping drive maybe once a month to the dental hygiene clinics at Hudson Valley. And that's the Figure task. Figure that out, right. Okay. You know, so Thank you. You're welcome. Have Thank a you. question. Michael? Yeah, uh, I don't know who can answer it. Maybe you can, Charlie. I see opponents, proponents, proponents, opponents uh, of a question that has already been voted on. To what extent have you groups reached out to each other to figure out where you can reach some common understanding and some common approaches to dental health? We've, we've reached out to some of our fellow community members ask, uh, who were on the... I mean, I mean, specifically yeah. among the folks here are among the folks most here. vocal uh, yes. on both sides. Where, where do you folks come together? to create a solution that can work for everybody. One of the things that I would say, Michael, is that our hope is that at the, we've, we've reached out to some folks who were very vocally opposed, and we've invited them to come to the April 22nd meeting to help generate some of those ideas that we're hoping comes out of that meeting, and we'll see where we go from there. 
Okay. And, and, and several of the people who are here tonight were invited by myself and also by the coalition to be here tonight as part of this. And I want to thank everyone who answered that invitation by showing up and spreading the word. Um, as Charlie pointed out, there was a lot of activity, there was a lot of discussion, there was some very effective networking done on both sides of the, uh, the line. And uh, while we have that communication going, let's, uh, let's exploit it and keep people engaged and, and move forward. So uh, we said at the first meeting, uh, what, no matter how this question fell, we weren't going to be done, you know, either way. So um, I'm happy to see people still engaged. and. Uh, I hope folks can make that. It's April 22nd, 6 p.m. here at the firehouse, uh, 6 to 8, and, and start working on some real solutions. Anyone Thank else? you. Thank you, Charlie. Anyways, Mrs. Albert, you have something to say? Sure, go ahead. Please do. <clears throat> you probably know me by now. I'm Mary Lou <laughs> Albert. I'm from Bennington. Um, we are here tonight at the invitation of Chairman uh, Greg Van Houten. Uh, before the March 3rd vote, our group talked to very many Bennington residents, and they voiced their opposition to fluoridate in public water supply for a variety of reasons. But none were opposed to preventative oral care. In reference to the terrible oral conditions here in Bennington that was reported in the state health report, they could not pinpoint exactly what age groups had what problems. And this is what the people told us. They didn't see exactly what the problems were. They referred to them. Did one location have worse need, or was it just the lack of dentists? People wanted to see the actual numbers. If there is a problem, and I, I think there is, but if there is a problem, a baseline has to be established so that anything that anyone does can be recorded to see if we are doing a good job or if we're not doing a good job, you've got to look in a different area. Some members of the Bennington Oral Health Coalition agree that if we had a bigger and a better dental clinic in Bennington, the oral health of Bennington would improve. We have heard through the grapevine that this might be in the works already, which would be a good thing. Maybe all that is needed our letters and phone calls to our legislators to pass a dental practitioner bill which would establish another, more cost-effective level of dental care located between the dental hygienists and the dentists. In, in the legislature right now, House Bill Number 1 and Senate Bill Number 20 are being discussed. Maybe if we had more dentists that took Medicaid, have longer hours, or volunteer a few more of their hours, it might improve situation, the situation of the oral care of Bennington. As a member of the Bennington Lions Club, I am asking our members to help educate school children on good oral health care where that program left off several years ago. I am sure most residents of Bennington will help wherever they can. So down the road, we don't have to face this divisive issue again. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Albert. Anyone else on the board have anything to say? No? OK. So are we going to take action on that? Uh, I was going to say that it entertain a motion to uh, recognize the Bennington Oral Health Coalition as a subcommittee of the Board uh, of Health. I'm uh, not in favor of doing that tonight. Uh, I, this is the first I've really heard about this uh, request. Um, 
it may well be in line, but I really would want to think about it before we create another committee or subcommittee uh, that doesn't have defined specific roles uh, and a time frame. Uh, so there may be a time and a place, but I don't think it's tonight. Well, you have several meetings before that advisory meeting and the, 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 right. yeah, the dental meeting too. So it's just, it's my last chance to make you do it. So <laughs> I'll get my arm back up. <laughs> but but I, I, it is my policy to wait a meeting to make a vote. So I'm fine with that. That's just, uh, I'm going to throw it out there. Um, anything else? Okay. I want to thank everybody for all of that and uh, for the effort and the attention to the issue. Um, again, uh, April 22nd, 6 p.m. here at the Bennington Firehouse, and uh, we'll take on this issue. Thank you for that. Okay. okay, next item is a uh, fire department private alarm ordinance first reading. This was uh, introduced at the last meeting uh, in, in concept. Uh, Stu, you want to head that? Actually, the next four items are all first readings of yeah. uh, ordinances or agreements that have been put before you before. Uh, in the first instance, uh, we're attempting to amend an ordinance that already exists for the purposes of being able to levy a fine against people who do not take care of their fire alarms in this particular case. We already have an ordinance in place for the police department where false alarms are registered, uh, where systems fail on a continuing basis and owners fail to take care of them, we can have to actually start levying fines against the owners of the buildings. We would propose to do the same for false alarms for fire departments. We have a number of uh, companies that are tied into uh, a, a, an alarm system, and if those alarms are not properly maintained, they can result in a lot of false alarms. We roll our equipment and we find there's nothing to do. So that's the first uh, proposal. It's relatively straightforward. It simply adds the fire department to it, an existing ordinance. And the second one is Should we the, just, uh, huh? I mean, do we have any oh. questions? Should we address them one by one? Yeah. <laughs> no. Because if we do one all four. Yeah. yeah, you're going to confuse. No, you probably confuse us. Right. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's, <laughs> Any I questions? guess the only thing ahead, I'd have John. to say is that I think it's about time, and I don't think there's a, a, a fee large enough to cover the, the false trip out there anyway. So I think it's appropriate, and it'll hopefully incentivize people to keep their systems up, up to par. So that's all I, I yeah. Yeah, had to say about that. Yeah, I have to agree with John. Tom? Uh, most of these uh, are tied in together anyway, aren't they? For, uh, or, or many of them, I should say most. Many are tied into the police and the fire department. So uh, there's simultaneous Yes, but call. there may be individual systems that... that uh, I'm sorry. I didn't have my microphone on. <laughs> How about that? Um, th there may be individual systems as well, one for police, one for fire. It really depends on when the building was built, when, when the, uh, the alarms were installed, uh -huh. how they were installed. But we, we do suffer a number of false alarms at very large institutions, um, and it's important that they be corrected in a timely fashion. I, I've heard I, um, it's in the middle of the night or you know the wrong time of the day, and that's really with a volunteer uh, department. I mean that even amplifies the problem. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What one point, Stu, is um, when I was just new on the board, there was an alarm that was going off every Sunday. It seemed over on the Morse Road area. And uh, it would ring, you could hear it come right across the river, ring through our whole neighborhood. And um, you had found out from the police department who it was. And I called their main office, which was outside of Boston. And they didn't know anything about it. They got somebody out there that week and fixed it. It was something that was being tripped by um, raccoons or something like that that were messing with something and tripping it. So I, I would want to make sure that. Um, we have an element here. We are contacting the property owners. Absolutely. To make sure. There, there, this is, um, it's not quite three strikes and you're out, but right. we, do an, we do a warning first. We talk with the property owners. We address the concerns. We try to understand what the schedule would be to make the, make right. the correction. But if it's, if it's a system that is ignored and it's right. constant. And I saw that in a draft. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that was recognized. Cause 
Okay. I'd just like to add one thing, and that is that uh, I remember this from um, when I was a kid, that more uh, firemen are, or women are injured in uh, going to uh, false alarms than at fires in, in general. So uh, I hope that, uh, you know, this progressive system will help them alleviate that or prevent them altogether. I would hope so too. All right. So are we going to vote on each one of these separately? Uh, well, voting, this uh, is the fir as you know, we now take two meetings once we introduce the ordinance okay. to give the yeah. public time to comment. So this is the first okay. reading. Okay. Um, if I may, the service yeah. reimbursement ordinance. Uh, this is an ordinance that, that a select board, not you folks, but a prior board, talked about at length, uh, in, in uh, and it's fairly new to the to the industry, but uh, in many cases where accidents occur, either due to maliciousness, negligence, or otherwise, fire departments are called to the scene. Uh, they expend materials, they, they break equipment, they do whatever they need to do uh, in the process of dealing with the incident, which is an incident that could have been avoided had people uh, taken proper care. Uh, many towns in Vermont, especially the larger towns, uh, are now seeking reimbursement from insurers uh, for these kinds of incidents. And uh, the initial reading of this some years ago, the, the board back then was concerned we really hadn't defined what those incidents were, or how they would be different from just a normal house fire. Uh, so we've, we've reworked <coughs> this, retooled this, the fire department and our uh, Department of Public Safety uh, Director have taken quite a hard look at other ordinances, incorporated that wording, and, and this, uh, should it be adopted by the board, would begin to allow us to seek reimbursement for mostly materials, not man hours, but materials uh, if you, that you use up during a response to an incident which turns out to be something that was truly avoidable or otherwise malicious or uh, due to negligence. Um, power line problems is another thing that's been identified where we are called to be on the scene uh, and uh, simply close the road uh, for, as a matter of protection until the power company can come. Uh, and there may be uh, materials or, or things that are used that are busted in the, in the course of that event. It gives us a chance to seek reimbursement. Who gets to define what materials are. These would be normal operating materials. It would be the fire department uh, in concert with the, the public safety commissioner. This is, they would be the ones that would uh, basically enforce this ordinance. Uh, the request for reimbursement would be run through the uh, public safety commissioner's office. Uh, the manager's office would obviously be copied and be involved uh, uh, through uh, our contracts administration department, which is generally Michelle Johnson. She does much of this work now in seeking reimbursement for damages to street signs and things by careless and negligent operation of motor vehicles. Stu, what is the success rate in working with insurance companies to get reimbursement for this kind of expense? Surprisingly very good. Uh, I, they I, will, believe, they would, I believe the town of Will Shaftesbury, they naturally pass it on to the insurance policy holder? And, you know, <coughs> that would be the case, yes. Yeah. And, and um, you know, in instances where the, the individual, and we find this, does not carry no. insurance, um, we would go <coughs> and go after the individual themselves or okay. the company, uh, uh, depending on, on the situation and, and the amount of effort involved. This has come up several times in budget discussions the yep. last few years. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, when you talk about uh, an auto accident <coughs> with fluid dispersed and you have to put down the, the take up material and clean it up and dispose of it, yeah. and, you know, yeah. it starts to add up, things like that. Tom, did you have something? Uh, do we, uh, sort of follows on that, that question or inquiries, that do we keep a, a list or is there a, a reference of how many times this appears and or we've had an issue with that? Uh, you know, we know don't. there's all incident reports, but do we keep us sort of like this should be a, this is a, something we shouldn't have had to be there? I would say that the fire department probably has an indication of how many incidents over the last several years. Uh, when this first came forward, I, I think they've been tracking it. Uh, 
some of the th things that, that do occur is if you use your extra t extrication tools, which are extremely expensive, and they are busted in the process, is it the taxpayer that should be buying those new tools, or is it the individual who was careless and negligent in the operation of the right vehicle? So, I mean, that's the basis for it. I believe they have that information, Tom. I don't personally have it. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just see that, for, at least for graphic discussion purposes, uh, just to get an idea so that it doesn't appear that the select board is just acting under a whim. There's actually right. some <laughs> significant activity in history that suggests that this is appropriate. I shall do that. Yeah, and, the, and obviously the concern is always to, you don't want to discourage people from calling 911 right. because they think they might get a bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good point. It, it's, uh, one thing that does concern me about this one is the open-endedness. Um, like Jim was saying, the carelessness or negligence or, or the cost of the materials, um, a lot of that could be, um, it, it's very subjective in some cases. Um, would we be able to define that uh, in a better manner? I mean, obviously, if, if the building's not up to code or something, that's, that seems obvious. But at that point, would the insurance company not, not be liable for the, the cost as well? I don't know how this all works, but I don't want to leave it open to interpretation because that could just yeah. get the town into some legal battle with anyone that wants to have it. Well, we're, we're, we're not talking here about um, incidents of, of fire in buildings where the building might not be up to code, uh, but the owner may not know that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about incidents that mostly involve uh, motor vehicle accidents uh, or malicious incidents where someone uh, sets fire to a dumpster uh, on a lark or something along those lines and ultimately is, is, is uh, apprehended. Um, power line failures, um, very specific things. This, this is really not meant to punish people who have, have a fire at their home Legitimate or at their business. Um, now there may be some of those that could have been avoidable, but we're, that's not the intent, is not to go after the people who, who suffer the accident. We're, we're talking about non-permitted burns, which are basically people who don't get uh, the appropriate permits to do a burn, or permitted burns that get out of control because of negligence, where the operator leaves the fire unattended or whatever, power line problems, and hazardous materials calls. A lot of times we, the fire department <coughs> is the organization that responds to a hazmat call, uh, and there are materials that are used in the containment that once they're used, they're used up. Right. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Um, the, the, the extreme would be where a specific tool, such as an extrication tool, is somehow damaged during during the operation. Uh, you know, you might be looking at two or three thousand dollars in a case like that. But the rest of this, much of this, is going to be less expensive materials, but materials that we now purchase through our operating supplies budgets uh, that essentially get used up in an incident. And right now the taxpayer simply replaces them. This would allow us to go after the owner. Uh, and, and in most of these cases, there's something, they were talking about somebody who was up, has already been uh, identified as a liable, liable Right, uh, so, so if I'm thinking about a car accident, it'd be tough to say that they were texting at that time. Not necessarily. Might, but they might be able to, right? They might be able to. Um, it's a little more obvious with, say, a drinking and driving uh, yep. scenario, right? Yep. Um, I mean, we still have a commitment to help them, obviously, and so we will. We do, and, and that's the point. You, you respond, but, you know, is the response uh, something that was uh, going to happen in the normal course of events, or is the response now necessary because somebody was careless or negligent in the operation of their motor vehicle? I have a question for you, Stu, and that is, um, if we recognize that this is a problem and has been a problem historically, is there a round figure that you can assign to, you know, the, the kind of money that we're, we're spending <coughs> with respect to... Uh, well, I can, I can attempt to get that information. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to be talking to the department about what information they have that, that points to their concerns and the reason for this. Uh, and I'll try to get an understanding of, of, of the kinds of materials from a cost perspective, what they are and what they cost over the long run. I don't have that for you now, but mm -hmm. we'll have it for you next time. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, and Chief Doucette and Vickers both had 
uh, I think a record of that when we were talking about that. Yeah, in and and both both uh, Chief Vickers and and Chief Doucette <coughs> have indicated a willingness to, to attend at the next meeting when we're we're up for adoption of the ordinance. Okay. Good idea. Next one. The next one is has a very long title. Uh, uh, it is the Municipal Solid Waste Variable Rate Pricing and Hauler Registration and Reporting Ordinance. This ordinance is, is now mandated by the state of Vermont. Uh, we at one time in the past when we were operating the transfer station under a, a different contract and we had people in the scale house, we were licensing all haulers that use the facility, charging them a $15 fee to have a license, but that gave them proof that they were picking up trash in Bennington. Uh, under our new agreement, which has been in place for now more than a decade, uh, <laughs> Casella has the right to take in trash from a 20 mile an hour, 20 mile radius in order to optimize their use of the transfer station. And because we don't pay that cost, it's a per ton cost at the door, um, there's no impact on the taxpayer for that increased use of the transfer station. Now the state has said, uh, we really want to know who's hauling. We want to know, to some extent, what they're hauling. We're going to be mandating that if they do curbside collection, that they also offer curbside collection of recyclables. And we want to guarantee that the price that they're charging is a unit price. It has a basis on some, uh, some fact, some <coughs> a dollar, so many dollars per bag, so many dollars per 30 gallon container. Uh, haulers will have the right to justify a transportation fee on top of that if in fact they're going long distances with their materials. But we, we find ourselves now uh, with the state with this new emphasis on, on really identifying where trash is coming from and, and trying to increase recycling in the state of Vermont to a 50% recycling. Uh, the state traditionally has been in the range of 30 to 35% uh, recycling. Most people do it on their own. They take it to the transfer station. Uh, other than knowing what the tonnage is, we have no way of knowing what percentage of, of that is actually separated from trash. So this is an attempt to have the haulers help us make those identifications. Uh, there is a cost that the haulers are going to see. Uh, the state has recognized that and they're starting to put in place programs to help the large haulers, especially the, the TAMs and the Casellas of this world who have numerous vehicles that now will have to be re-outfitted in order to handle this kind of material. <laughs> Bennington is a step ahead of the process because we do have scales at the transfer station. We've been doing a per unit cost at our transfer station for years. It's either per bag or per pound. You can pay either way. But now the haulers are going to have to do that for curbside collection. They're going to have to figure out how they price those those containers that you see along the curbside. Um, so will that pricing be public? How will that pricing will be public because okay. they will they will file it with us okay. and it'll be available to people. Um, uh, and ultimately, the ordinance and the state of Vermont will require that they begin to report on a quarterly or semi-annual basis their collection rates and their recycling rates. Um, Every hauler who operates in Bennington will be required to be licensed here. Um, most haulers that operate in Bennington probably operate in Shaftesbury, Woodford, Pownall, Hoosick Falls. So from those that operate within the, in this area will have to be licensed in each and every town that they operate. And part of the beauty of the ordinance is we're all, all of the towns that are attempting to form this alliance, which is a 13 town consortium uh, are attempting to adopt the same ordinance and the fee for the license may be different depending on your administrative costs. Uh, we'll probably look back at a $15 fee which is what we were charging before. We think we have in the range of no more than five or six haulers currently operating in Bennington. Okay. So 15 um, per vehicle? This, the fee would, we're, we're going to look at a fleet Okay. fee. Um, if you have more than so many vehicles, it'd probably be a one-time $50 fee, $15 for each vehicle that the small haulers might, might own. So we're, we're going to try to 
balance that out. Yeah, work that out, and it's, I don't think it's contained here in the ordinance at this time. The fee will be established by, by each town uh, as it sees fit. Uh, but at least we're all operating under the same premise. Uh, we'll be able to consolidate that information, and at, and at some point in the future, as, as we work through this, Bennington County will be able to tell its citizens what is being generated, where, what's being recycled, where it's going. And those of us here in the southwestern corner of Vermont, uh, as well as the southeastern corner of Vermont, uh, have a unique situation because much of our waste, not a lot of it, but some of it, goes out of state. Uh, we have a couple of haulers that operate in Bennington that have two or three customers, and you see the big trucks around town. Uh, that waste is, is coming they're coming into the state, collecting the waste, and taking it out of state and disposing of it. And the state will be actually enforcing uh, the licensing regimes that each town will, will adopt because those folks are going to need to be licensed. And even though their trash is not ending up here, uh, they're operating here. We need to know what they're doing and where it's going and how they're handling it. And they're also going to be facing the same recycling requirements if they want to do business in the state of Vermont. So it's a... Uh, it's a very long title, uh, pretty straightforward ordinance, uh, and all 13 towns that have been working together are, many have already adopted it. Uh, we're Line three where it says identify their territory. What's the process for that? How does that, how does that look? I'm sorry, Mike. I identify their territory. <laughs> their territory. They have to tell us what their range is. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, I mean, if we use Casella, Casella operates within a 20-mile radius. Of Bennington, they operate throughout the county. Uh, they they run two transfer stations. Uh, TAM operates at least one transfer station. is seeking to operate a, a materials recycling facility. Um, the big boys have greater ranges. Yeah. We've got some small haulers that simply operate in Bennington, and and they'll tell us what their range is. Stu, I've got a question for you. Are, are there other places in the in the in the state or in the country that have implemented? Um, this sort of uh, ordinance? Every town in the state will have implemented this ordinance by June of but 2015. Have, okay. So, okay. This is new. It's new. as a new requirement. It came out of a law that was adopted last year, but it has to be in place by June of 2015. But we don't per se have a track record on it, I think, is where no, it's going. Yeah. Right. Let's do with the, uh, the licensing charge. Is pretty, it sounds pretty nominal, uh, but is there a report back from the haulers to the town, or does that go to the state and then back down to the town? The, the, re wondering. the reporting will come to the towns initially because it'll be an individual ordinance. Um, we may be back before you uh, if we do form the alliance and it's up and running and we actually have a means of reporting directly to the alliance, um, then that we, we would be back and, and look to perhaps alter the ordinance so those reports go directly to the, to the alliance. Initially, the reports will come to us and we will disperse them to the state. So uh, either through the alliance or directly, depending on where we end up with, with the next item on the agenda. You're not going to have a, you don't anticipate a very significant overhead uh, ex administrative expense? No, um, we really don't. We, we issued licenses through the collections department years and years ago. They still have forms that they, they have shown me. Uh, our forms are a little more complex because we're also looking for certain reporting requirements. Um, but we don't anticipate that there'll be a large burden of administrative work involved in this. There will be more work for the haulers, though. Okay. Yep. Thank you. With, with the more work for the haulers, there could be a lot of work that has to be done, like you said, to their equipment. Um, have you been involved in any conversations about fees to the user? Uh, is that no, we haven't. We haven't. The uh, through the alliance meetings with the state of Vermont, uh, Trevor Mance has participated, uh, has indicated that um, his costs will be substantial to modify much of his fleet. Some of the newer vehicles probably won't need modification, but some of the older ones might. Um, and will that impact his fees? Potentially. Uh, but that's going to be, we're not getting involved in whether the fee that you're charging is the appropriate fee for the business. Right. All we want to know is that it's a unit-based price, and it's the right. same for yep. all your customers. No, I just didn't know with the, with the conversation yeah. that you've had if you've had any, I don't know, 
Yeah, we, the, the state understands that, uh, and they didn't understand it when they first passed the, the, the law, that there are going to be substantial costs involved for the haulers. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Yeah. All right. Next item. And the last one, uh, I, I sent you in your packet a revised uh, version of the alliance agreement, the interlocal agreement, which is the uh, 13 town consortium. Uh, we, we asked, collectively asked uh, Rob Wilmington to take a look at this from the municipal ordinance perspective. Uh, we're going to make some slight changes in the document you originally received, such as re removing the names of the towns involved, because not everyone may end up joining the alliance. Uh, so it, there are some small changes that will be made throughout this particular ordinance. We'll have those finalized for you when you take a look at it at the next meeting. Um, but I wanted you to see the changes as compared to what you had originally. Uh, and this has now had, had council review. Uh, and uh, Mr. Wilmington's very confident that we meet not only the municipal regulations that allow us to do the <coughs> ordinance, but also the, the state laws regarding the formation of interlocal agreements and alliances, which is a, a term specific to solid waste collection and maintenance. So we'll have all of these on the agenda for the next time and be looking for formal action from the board. Thank you, Steve. Um, next item, we have a proclamation for National Library Week. Sharon, you want to read it? <laughs> you want me to read it? Could be your last official item. You want me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You have a lot of whereas there, Greg. Go for yeah. it. Whereas libraries create potential and possibilities within their communities, campuses, and schools, and whereas libraries level the playing field for all who seek information and access to technologies, and whereas libraries continually grow and evolve in how they provide for the needs of every member of their communities, and whereas libraries and librarians open up a world of possibilities through innovative programming, cultural and educational resources, and promoting the power of reading, and whereas librarians are trained tech savvy professionals providing technology training and access to downloadable content like ebooks, and whereas libraries support democracy and affect social change through their commitment to provide equitable access to information for all library users, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status, and whereas libraries, librarians, Library workers and supporters across America are celebrating National Library Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Bennington Select Board, do hereby proclaim National Library Week April 12th through 18th, 2015. We encourage all residents to visit the library this week to take advantage of the wonderful library resources available at your library. We should say libraries. Um, <laughs> Good point. Dated at Bennington, Vermont, this 23rd day of March 2015, Select Board, Town of Bennington. Do I have a motion to so move. accept that? I'll second. second. Any discussion? All in favor? That is unanimous, one absent. I'll thank circulate you. the original for your signatures. <laughs> Nicely read. Oh, I thank you. Very nice. <laughs> I knew you could do it. I had to learn to read just for this <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Uh, we have some liquor licenses, too. Yes, uh, these are, once again, all renewals. We have no new licenses added to the list. Nice thing. Uh, there are six first-class renewals and four second-class renewals, and I will circulate that for your signatures as well. Thank you. Okay. And now the citizens portion. Do we have any citizens who would like to address the select board, ask questions? Is that, is that Verizon request not? What's that? Is there something that Verizon request? Is that not before us tonight? I'm sorry. The Verizon. The Verizon. The Verizon? Oh, this executive session. Okay. Thank yeah, you. we have a contract sure. issue. Yeah, contract. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Powell, please. Yep. Uh, good evening. My name is Dave Crowley. I live on Week Street. Uh, I think I've been here before with you and asked about this on a larger scale, but. Maybe if we can get more specific, I can get some results. I think we need a pedestrian crossing signal 
placed at the intersection of Weeks and Dewey Streets. It's the only crosswalk on the entire length of Dewey Street between Main and Monument that doesn't have even the most simple crosswalk indication. There are uh, flashing red lights at Elm and at all other crosswalks except this one. There, oops. Uh, there is at least a uh, diamond-shaped yellow uh, warning sign showing a pedestrian and an arrow showing it's a crosswalk. But there's nothing at Weeks and Dewey. And specifically, this is the intersection right by the hospital exactly. entrance when you come right weeks. Mary right, house. and crosses over to the walkway that goes up into Putnam Memorial yes. Hospital and UCS and all that. Oh. Uh, the distance from Monument to Elm Street, which is completely unbroken and minimally residential, is over three quarters of a mile. And people can get the speed limit there is 30 miles an hour. There aren't very many people who do 30 miles an hour on that street at that distance. It's also the approach to the hospital, so it adds not only the legitimate emergency vehicles, but distressed drivers as well. Distractions like the very fact that they have to go to the hospital in the first place, and then add in whatever extra stresses may fit in, then add the traffic that the closure of the North Adams Hospital is adding, and really this is just an accident of some magnitude that through Nothing but the grace of God uh, has not happened yet. There hasn't been a big, major T-bone uh, side swipe accident. Oh, I, I beg to differ. Well, yeah, not there was one, but was it wasn't. It? There yeah, was, it was one about two years, years ago. Yes, yeah, about years two years ago. Was yeah. a guy on a motorcycle yeah. driving erratically was and it? going and cutting through traffic when he yeah. should not have. Normal drivers blow through that stop sign all the time. Sometimes they're stressed because they're going to see somebody in the hospital. Sometimes they've got somebody in the car that needs to go to the hospital right now. Sometimes it's just they're unfamiliar with the road, but I walk that road every day, and people go through this, blow through the stop signs all the time. Uh, the most charming surprise that I got here when, uh, when I moved to Vermont was the courteous and polite Vermont driver, and they're still very much in evidence. But they're getting crowded out by drivers who don't recognize the value of patience and courtesy. There's just a lot of traffic now from this tr sort of tri-state area of Massachusetts and New York and Vermont. And they're all going to this, uh, to the hospital under various stressors. Uh, I request a flashing crossing alert at the intersection of Weeks and Dewey for the safety of Bennington's residents and visitors, both walkers and drivers. And I uh, have downloaded uh, some information from Ray Products, R-A-I Products in, there in Texas, that they do pedestrian uh, crosswalk stuff, they do electric stuff, and they also do uh, relatively simple to install solar flashing, what are called uh, RRFBs, rapid flashing beacons, and uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, and they're one of the most effective devices for getting the motorist attention, according to a study by the Federal Highway Administration. And you can put those up with a solar panel. And there's no wiring, there's no trenching, there's no nothing. You stick a pole in the ground, and it starts flashing. Nobody sees that crosswalk. I, I stand dressed like this in that crosswalk, and people blow by all the time. You want to go like this? Yeah. <laughs> There, there, there are a lot of distractions, as you mentioned there, traffic and the, the stress and distress drivers. So, so we have talked about this before. And, and, uh, uh, we, have, we've not talked about using flashing beacons at crosswalks. No, just um, visibility at that. The problem with the, I previously suggested that, there, that the little stanchions with right. the, you know, stop, save off, or pedestrians. Right, like that's that. what we... The intersection, downtown, when <laughs> you were talking about it, people were hitting those sort of things. Didn't right. That? But there's really not a lot of speed going on down there. And that intersection at Dewey and um, Weeks is a small, as are many intersections I noticed when I first moved here. They're smaller to a degree. And if you put anything in the middle there, it's not going to make it through the day. Right. It, no, and, I, and I'm not actually, Dave, I'm, 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 I'm thinking that uh, this might be an intersection where uh, some sort of flashing alert would be appropriate. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the flashing lights at Elm Street are solar powered. 
Uh, those are red flashers because we want people to stop. You, you can probably find yellow, yeah, which is a warning are. situation. We'll certainly take a look at that. Um, unfortunately, I can tell you from my own personal experience that the red flashers at Dewey and Allen don't, don't necessarily always work. I was <laughs> T-boned at that intersection and uh, had my car totaled um, by, right. by an individual who, who was very, very stressed and was leaving the hospital and leaving a very sick person behind just not yeah. paying attention to yeah. what was going and, on. And I have had conversations with personnel at the hospital about that situation, um, and they are aware of it. Uh, they try to use their folks at the door when people are leaving and try and recognize you know, issues like that, but um, they they're promised to talk about that and see what they could, more we could do about that. But I think that is a good target intersection for some infrastructure upgrade. It, it, yeah, that's a very high traffic pedestrian and, and vehicle, yeah. Uh, I agree. Uh, stuff too, sure. I'll take that from Dave. I'll give it right to Stu. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. It's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, while we're on the subject, yeah. uh, there's also no stop sign from uh, if you go along weeks uh, and you cross Putnam. Um, you know, that's the. You know, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's. Everywhere else, there's a stop sign all the way out to. There's uh, not a stop sign on Putnam, you mean? Four yeah, right. Four way stop. Is not that, a four way stop. There's oh. a two way stop on yeah, Putnam, but it, right, but not it doesn't the other stop on. You know, the other right. intersections have four way. Um, is there a reason for that? Uh, in fact, the, the four way stop at uh, Jefferson. Is it Jefferson? Right. Yeah. 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 It's Washington. Washington. It's Washington. Yeah. Washington. 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 Yeah. Right. Um, that was installed specifically. Uh, because cars, as they come up from South Street, there, there is a sight distance issue as they crest that hill. The idea was to try to slow that traffic down because the street is relatively narrow and if you've got cars parked on the street, uh, you've got people going at high rate of speed moving out into the, beyond the center line of the highway. Uh, so it was, it was to give a little extra care for that particular part of the street. Um, I would not necessarily be in favor of a stop, a four-way stop at every intersection that we have. Um, I think there are primary roads that you really should let traffic flow, um, but we can certainly take a look at that intersection if you think it warrants. What, what we would do is we would contract with an engineer because you have to do a warrant analysis in order to add signalization of any kind to an intersection. So we have to know what the traffic rates are, what the speed of traffic is. Uh, safety factors, visibility, sight distance, those kind of things. Okay. I'm, I'm just uh, I'm thinking personally when you're driving through that and on your way to the hospital or something, uh, that sometimes the folks that are coming north and south uh, on Putnam, I think it is right, yeah. uh, are not paying too much attention sometimes and you're blowing through and all of a sudden you're part of the T-bone parade. But if they're, it may be an overzealous uh, concern, but I, I would think it'd be helpful to look at it. The study will tell us that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other citizens? We do not. Okay. Um, manager's report. I have nothing for you tonight. <coughs> wow. Okay. Uh, Sorry, other business. Then. I know it's your last meeting. <laughs> so I, I thought I you might have something special or anything. Yeah. <laughs> John, do you have any other business tonight? Uh, no. Okay, James. I just want to thank you for your service, Greg. It's, uh, it's been great serving with you. You've uh, clearly demonstrated tremendous integrity and competence in uh, your tenure as uh, the chairman. You've always been prepared. And the thing that I think I will always remember is even in the most contentious of meetings, you were absolutely unflappable. Oh. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. It's been my privilege. Thomas? Uh, boy, I just want to echo that. Uh, Greg, it's been a pleasure. I came in right after you and you mentored me uh, and told me as I sat here, if you have a question, ask it, but at the same time be respectful. And I saw that throughout the time that you were on the board and also as uh, chair. The uh, times were not easy last year. and. Uh, you took a lot of the board flack for us, and uh, I really appreciate that. And you, uh, you're going to be missed. Uh, the community is going to miss you at this side of the table. 
but I have a feeling that we'll be hearing from you, as you said, on the other side of the mic and with your <laughs> other interest in the, the arts and the, the well-being of this community. I think uh, we haven't heard the last of Greg. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for and uh, I'll thank you as well. I'll let go of everything that's been said so far. And I do have one piece of other business. I, I addressed it with Stu this afternoon by phone, but um, because of the construction on Benmont Avenue, I've been contacted by a lot of citizens with some pretty salty language. <laughs> so anyway, I think we're going to have to ask people to bear with it I think we'd all wish that it wouldn't take 18 months. And Stu, we've talked about that. Maybe you want to comment on that for the public? Yes. Um, you may recall, uh, those of you who were watching discussions back then, but this, this bridge project has, has been vetted for uh, nigh on probably a decade. Uh, it went from a two-lane two uh, deck replacement project to we actually looked at a three-lane uh, project to increase uh, stacking capabilities uh, as you come back across the bridge. Uh, when those prices came in in an estimate, uh, the board went back and asked the agency to rethink the two-lane approach. Uh, once we agreed that the two-lane approach was feasible, uh, then it became how do we construct it. And uh, the fastest way to have constructed this bridge would have been to close it in its entirety detour all traffic around it. Uh, I think prior boards were very sympathetic to the business owners in that stretch of road who would have been entirely cut off. So the ultimate decision was to encourage the state to bid the project with one lane traffic. Uh, in ideally, it would have been signalized so that traffic could move in a north-south direction. Uh, uh, however, uh, the approach from Northside Drive onto the bridge is far too short for the amount of traffic. Uh, we would have had traffic backing up into Northside Drive waiting for a signal to change. Uh, so the decision ultimately was made to have northbound traffic only and detour all southbound traffic. Um, it took us a while, and I don't, I don't mean us, but the way that the project was signed uh, led to a lot of confusion. Uh, people found themselves kind of in no man's land, having gotten to the bridge and realized they couldn't get across, uh, backing into the various businesses that were there and trying to turn around. Some were actually ticketed going across through the construction zone uh, against the signalization. Uh, the state, uh, in fact, has re-signed the project to try to um, encourage people not to find themselves in that situation. Uh, I even suggested that they close off the slip lane uh, entirely and force people to go to the light, and therefore you have to make a conscious decision. But that would all require a change in contract uh, and, and a change in contract price, just as now changing the traffic flow would be a massive change in contract and contract price. So uh, it, it may be that there'll be some additional changes made to the traffic flow pattern, but the project is now a, a single lane, always open. It will take potentially 18 months, but I think much of the end time is uh, planned to avoid uh, serious weather concerns so that the contractor does not find himself in a uh, liquidated damages situation at the end of the project because they haven't got the grass growing yet, they haven't got the curbing in. Uh, the bridge decking will be replaced much sooner than that, and it may be open to traffic much sooner than that, um, because it's a relatively straightforward project. New deck, uh, new rails, some bridge abutment shoring up, and some work in the river. Uh, fairly straightforward, but it's going to be uh, a little confusing for people initially, and we hope that as the better weather comes and daylight is with us most more time than not, uh, that that kind of confusion will, will end and people will get used to the flow. I, I have seen an improvement down there very quickly. You know, within a couple of days, I think that the habitual 
slip lane turn yeah. has, yeah, has been to relieved. There wasn't anybody that was making that mistake yeah. when I was down there. I can't avoid it. I just keep doing it. I'm, I'm so <laughs> tempted to do it. I come off the highway, I got my right blinker on, and I oh, got to go straight. But um, <laughs> so, anything else? There one more thing. Uh, uh, we did, John McFadden and Sharon Brush and I have volunteered to develop a set of performance metrics. Uh, We've done a lot of research. Uh, I've spoken about some of that research with, with Stu, shown him that we've been meeting regularly. We're probably going to have something to show to Stu uh, to, uh, to work with, and then within, I would say, maybe a month to show to the select board. Thank you. Sharon? Just thanks. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <clears throat> Um, I'm I have a sure couple. We haven't seen the last. Of you, so. No, a couple quick things. Yeah, the, the cultural Bennington uh, planning committee is uh, working on the event we told you about, Exposure in Bennington 2015. We've had some uh, some great commitments as exhibitors and sponsors. Um, Bennington College this week um, signed on as an exhibitor, and we expect to see a representation of Tangoon City's cultural uh, relationship with us. So um, that's exciting. Something that you folks had a lot to do with. And um, on Benmont Avenue, I just want to remind people those businesses are open. Uh, it, you have to access them from one side or the other or just from the south. But uh, please don't forget your favorite <coughs> businesses just because it might take you another couple minutes to get there. Uh, as Stu indicated, you know, lo losing access on a road can be very difficult for a small business over an extended period of time. So uh, try to keep those folks in mind when you're out shopping. Um, and. Again, I want to thank uh, the voters, the select board, the town staff, uh, Linda Bermudez for putting up with us all this time and uh, for some of the longest meetings probably ever known to man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's about it. So uh, thank you all. Appreciate your support. I will be back uh, with, with that other stuff. I move we go into executive session. Okay. Do I have a second? All right. Uh, it was an executive session regarding contracts. Any discussion? All those in favor? That is six in favor. Thank you, everyone.